Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My guest this evening, this evening is Deacon David Hess. I look forward to having Deacon on the program. Deacon's a good friend of an, uh, a common, a mutual friend, Patrick Madrid. And uh, Pat Madrid has been encouraging me to get David on the show. You may have seen David's uh, name as a co-author of a book called Jesus, Peter, and the Keys. So that, may, that name might be familiar to you. As Deacon David and I talked this afternoon about what theme to focus on this evening besides his journey of coming back to the church of his childhood, it became evident to David that the theme that uh, describes his journey at a number of levels is the sorrow of separation and the joy of union, but specifically the impact of separation in the body of Christ as well in our own lives as followers of Christ this issue of separation. So we'll look at that tonight. And David will talk about um, how that theme opened his heart to the church and has he, how he understood it during the time that he was apart from the church of his upbringing that brought him back to the Catholic Church. So stay with us. Our, uh, this is an important uh, time for you to ask your questions about the journey of faith. Uh, so call us with your questions at 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Deacon David, welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be here. It's good to have you here. You know, your book, Jesus, Peter, and the Keys, I know from my work, has been very influential in helping many, many people understand that this whole issue of the papacy is not a new invention, but that is traced all the way back to Christ, the scriptures, sure. uh, the early church fathers, and that was the purpose of this book. So we may talk more on that theme later. Thank we'll you. play it by ear. The Holy Spirit is influential, uh, whether it be that book or this show, however he works. That's right. Well, good to have you on the, on the show. Let's begin, as we usually do, and share with the audience a bit of your early spiritual journey, if you would. Okay, thank you. I was uh, born in upstate New York and uh, born into a Catholic family, went to Catholic school, um, received First Communion in the Catholic faith, and it uh, wasn't long after it, into my early teen years, that I decided, well, that was enough of the Catholic Church, and I pretty much stepped away from it. But uh, fortunately now, unfortunately then, when I met my girlfriend, she was in an, a, a Catholic family, and part of the requirements for dating her, <laughs> which took place on Saturday evenings for dinner, was I'd go to the home, and we'd have mass. We'd go to mass first, so that was necessary. So that was my my continued participation, although reluctantly, with the Catholic faith. Uh, would, would that qualify as evangelistic dating on her part? I guess it would. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> and the family was all cahoots in that, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it, it, all dates were chaperones, so the dates <laughs> took place at, right. at church. But, um, and then soon after that, um, we were married. Uh, we were married young. She was 18. I was 19 when we were married. We were married in the Catholic faith, and uh, that was the point where I became the head of the house and decided, okay, we don't have to go to church anymore. And so we left the church, now, both my wife and I. When you say we, was it her following you reluctantly? She was following reluctantly All right. and, and sadly. And I imagine the family wasn't real happy about that either. Uh, her, her family was not uh, pleased at all, but uh, they're good people okay. and uh, patient and uh, prayer-filled people. All right. Okay, what happened? Then? Well, um, <laughs> what became the center of your life then if the church <laughs> wasn't? <laughs> Football on Sundays right. was the center of my life, <laughs> or any other thing to keep me busy, but certainly not my faith walk with Christ. But... Within our, our marriage, our first few years of marriage, it was, it was a superficial relationship, imagine. We were in love, but we were in love as teenagers without Christ yeah. would be in love. And, uh, but with her parents' influence, they gave us a gift of marriage encounter, a marriage encounter weekend. So I thought, oh great, here's an opportunity to be romantic. And uh, so off we went for a ma marriage encounter weekend. And after, oh, a day, I think it was, I became quite disgusted and said, where's the romance? All they're talking about is Jesus Christ. What in the world does this have to do with marriage? <laughs> and uh, it was at this point it, it, that the, the sorrows of separation really began. Huh. 
and talking with my wife one-on-one -on -one during this marriage encounter weekend, uh, she broke down in tears because for all of the, well, for these first few years, she really wanted to participate with Christ. She wanted to be participating in the Mass and have a faith-filled marriage. Yeah. And she reluctantly went along, and, and I led her away. But uh, it started to wake me up. So the encounter weekend, did it, did it authentically awaken faith within you, or you were reluctantly saying, I suppose, for my wife's sake, I'll uh, show an interest and move in that direction? It sparked. Okay. It sparked. And because it wasn't my idea, therefore it couldn't have had that much value. <laughs> uh, okay. But um, it, it did spark in me memories of my faith, and she found it important, and I had made the decision, honey, if it's that important, we'll investigate it. But at the same time, I was remembering my experience mm -hmm. as a young child. And what really was starting to play in my mind was there were times, eight, nine, ten years old, I can remember with my dad, mm -hmm. and uh, he would come home early or from work, it was on a weekday, and he would take me to Mass. He'd say, son, let's go to Mass. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a Sunday. We didn't have to go, but it was something mm -hmm. that was important to him. Mm -hmm. And the combination of the sorrow that my wife was expressing and her desire to return kind of reminded me of some. What is it? There's right. something important here. It was important enough for my father. My wife is calling for it. I've got to look. So you have this drawing back to faith. Mm -hmm. Did it bring you back to the Catholic Church right away? That's a good question. <laughs> the, our faith, our journey began at this point. And being from Catholic families and growing up and being catechized, where would you think we would go to find Christ? Well, we participated in evangelical-type churches, uh -huh. uh, fundamentalist churches, uh, non-denominational-type uh, programs mm -hmm. and seminars. That's where we sought Christ. Interesting. Uh, <clears throat> You're apart from, from your Catholic upbringing, both of you, mm -hmm. right? You have the spark is a, awakened within you, and now you decide to look back. Do you end up going to the Bible churches, the evangelical churches, on your own initiative, or were they showing more initiative to bring you there than, let's say, the church of your upbringing? I think when we started to look for Jesus Christ, yeah. the popular notion was that Jesus Christ was available in these Christian churches. Okay. And mm -hmm. the concept of Christ and the presence of Christ in his own church, in the Catholic Church, didn't ring All right. that, that much with us. Okay. So what did you find when you went to these churches? Well, did you like what you find? It? Well, sure. Uh, we went, and uh, I think the first participation in some of these churches was the uh, black gospel church, mm -hmm. and a majority of, of black Americans. And But the music was good, <laughs> so we liked it. And uh, from there, we started checking out different uh, seminars at evangelical-type churches, mm -hmm. and we found a, a nice community, a friendly community, a, uh, a social community within a, a, a fundamentalist type, a non-denominational church. Mm -hmm. And so there we found home mm -hmm. for us, as we thought. Became active for about how long? Maybe a year, year and a half, something like that. Right. And uh, right. that was just the okay. beginning. So our theme is the sorrow of separation, and you've started to touch a little bit on that, the sorrow that your wife was experiencing, mm -hmm. uh, the separation of her childhood faith. And I haven't pushed you too much on... on on how the two of you reacted, interacted during that time, because I wondered if she maybe felt a little bit betrayed right after marriage, and all of a sudden, all right, yeah, boom, there we are. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah. not going there yet unless we yeah. want to go to that point. <laughs> but the issue is her sorrow of separation, and then you've got some memories of your own childhood from your father. If you look back then to that time as an evangelical Bible Christian in that environment, how did you understand? How did they understand? the issues of separation and unity in the church. There was an issue of separation and unity in the church as far as each one of those churches were concerned. Their relationship was them, themselves, and Christ. That was the separa or that was the unity. Mm -hmm. That that was the extent of the unity. There wasn't a sense of loss, a sense of mm -hmm. of of the gifts of Jesus Christ missing. So 
looking back on it now, I, I saw it as unfortunately mm. superficial. Okay. All right. They didn't see, which is interesting because there are, I've encountered a number of Protestant churches that actually have brochures in their front foyer. They're Protestant churches, but they have a little thing saying why we aren't Protestant. I mean, they're so far from the Reformation sure. and so far from the schisms that they no longer even see their existence in relationship to any of these mm-hmm. other churches. And basically, it's like all of a sudden landing in the middle of a movie. And there you are. You don't know anything about the first part. You just Your, your whole existence starts mm-hmm. there. Well, not to speak disparagingly, right. but there seem, there, 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 there's a pool of mediocrity that takes place. If, if there's nothing important, nothing to cling to, then we can make it ourselves. And it's good enough for me, that's fine. Right. If it's not good enough for you, there's another church, or we can create another Christian community. Okay. That is good enough. All right. Um, at that point in time, at that place in your journey, what word was the Catholic Church at all in your thinking? It was there. But what prompted it was what we started to hear was not what was right with that particular Christian community as much as what was wrong with the Catholic community in in various groups, even from uh, sermons. Not to, and their intention wasn't to to do damage to to Catholicism, but it was to substantiate the community of ex-Catholics, mm-hmm. majority of them, okay. that may participating. And what little I remember in my catechesis, and much of it I forgot, I knew that what I was hearing wasn't ringing true hmm. for one reason or another. In other words, it, it was an inaccurate expression. It, as far as I knew. As you could remember as, yeah. of what the Catholic Church truly taught or believed. Yeah. Just curious that I'm not, again, that picking uh, things here, but do you remember your preachers preaching anti-sermons against Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists, uh, not Episcopalians, a one. <laughs> and Orthodox? Or, no, and not a one. <laughs> it was always the Catholics that were baited yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and criticized, interestingly. Um, well, and aside to that, when there are uh, converts that, that see the Catholic faith as the true church, as they come to realize that there's oftentimes a certain level of pride that enters in, and they know the Catholic Church is the church, and they'll become orthodox at the last second. They'll just, you know, because they spoke for so long against Catholicism. Interesting, yes. That uh, brings them into the orthodox church. We might talk about that, because often we'll get questions about, uh, did you ever consider the orthodox, and we'll, Mm -hmm. we'll get into that in a little bit. All right, so you're, here you are in the church, and uh, you're hearing from the pulpit direct attacks on the Catholic faith of your yeah. childhood. What did that start to do to your own? Well, it started to anger me, and I, I started to want to defend something I didn't really know. And at the same time, we were being asked um, by the pastor for Charmaine and I, my wife, to commit ourselves mm-hmm. to this community, to dedicate ourselves to this community. And it was at this moment that I thought, wait, stop. How can I leave a faith and join another one if I don't even know the faith it is that I'm leaving? So I met with the pastor and I said, Andy, look, before I can consider joining this faith community, I have to go back to my Catholic church and find find out what it is exactly. Mm -hmm. Did he fight you at all on that? Did he challenge you? Well, he gave me a one-liner. He said... Dave, if you're truly going to see, search the truth, then you'll be back. And that was the last time I, I saw him. You came back. Okay, yeah. interesting. All right. All right, what would you find? And uh, talk about that, well, your, your, that aspect of your journey. My in-laws' uh, participation in their, in their prayer and patience <laughs> up to this point was um, now they were encouraging. Okay, take your time. Be patient. Um, while we were going through these different mm-hmm. Protestant uh, denominations and such, but they found an opportunity to say, okay. They helped us find a Catholic Answers conference <laughs> in San Diego. And this was probably in the late 80s, I think it was. And um, so we participated in this conference, and I thought, my gosh, 
the church has answers. And they're solid ones. They're good. So I decided, well, the first books I'm going to get, I really need to learn about this Catholic faith. I picked up a three-volume set by uh, Jurgens, The Faith of the Early Fathers. Mm -hmm. And I also picked up uh, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma by Ludwig Ott. Mm -hmm. uh, easy reading. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, he didn't start in the easiest. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think... Um, I know that uh, Surprise by Truth and such hadn't been published yet, which are no, 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 a little bit no. easier start into <laughs> no. the journey. But. I don't know as if I'd recommend those, or, or at least Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma right, right on the a, outset. That's a rough one. Now, the other three-volume set, which I know audience is always saying, what was that book with a book? Jurgen's three-volume set on faith of the early fathers. early fathers is a wonderful set of collections so the of the, it's the quotes of the early fathers arranged chronologically and topically. It's a great set of books. So I'm sorry, but a little advertisement there. <laughs> well, so what did so you do with those when you got them? I dug into them. <laughs> I, I, I look at them. I still go back to them all the time, yeah. and they're highlighted and re-highlighted and penned yeah. out, and it, it's, it's amazing, but it, invaluable. Okay. The answers to questions that I wanted were right mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. and it, but it's not the end. But it was a beginning for me to, mm -hmm. to understand, okay, here's the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, there's the intellectual side of it. The patristics brings me into the spiritual aspect. And, and my desire I found, I think, uh, uh, for reading, for, 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 for the heart, food for the heart, the Eastern mm -hmm. Fathers especially, mm -hmm. uh, St. John Chrysostom, mm -hmm. St. Basil, uh, the mm -hmm. Eastern Fathers especially. So here you're discovering not only the Catholics' argument to these apologetic issues, but you're seeing them expressed very clearly in the words of the early church fathers. Now, let me ask you this. What did you start to feel about that old Christian community that you had been a part of that had been giving you other... A couple of things. Yeah. Sorrow and anger. Okay. That uh, I felt misled to a point, but the sorrow was because of the lack of knowledge, yeah. the lack of desire for these communities, because there isn't a sense of detachment. Yes. There isn't a sense of separation from the church, so there, there is not a search mm -hmm. for home. Uh, I'm glad you expressed it that way, because it is a sorrow for the ignorance, mm -hmm. the lack of information that is there, and you and I even talked a little bit earlier on a, on a separate issue about how we would love to be able to break through the kernel of this yeah. undesire to hear the fullness, uh, but I'm glad you expressed it that way because that's what we wish for them is to hear the fullness of the church. Absolutely. Well, how was your wife taking all this? She came right along. <laughs> she loved because in her husband, finally was yeah. the expression of what she felt in her heart, what she wanted to be. She wanted to be a practicing Catholic. She yeah. wanted to practice her faith, and I kept her from that hmm. for for the first few years of her marriage. And uh, so we joyfully grabbed hold of our faith and, and ran with it. <laughs> you were telling me that you got to that one point, you were ready to come in, but there seemed like barriers. <sighs> Remember? <laughs> which, which, which was it? Oh, okay, <laughs> about being confirmed. Oh, uh, yeah. th thanks, Marcus. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, uh, in my catechesis, one thing that didn't take place in my Catholic walk was being confirmed as, uh, as a teenager. And so I think I was about 24, 25 years old, and realizing after reading about the faith and learning more about it and understanding the grace available to us through the sacraments, I needed to be confirmed. And I didn't need to be confirmed somewhere down the road. I needed to be confirmed now. And so I went to the parish priest and I said, Father, I need to be confirmed now. He said, well, we've got a program to put you in, and uh, in about a year from now, when the cycle comes around, then perhaps that, Father, no. <laughs> no, I, I'm a baptized Christian. I'm Catholic. I know the sacraments. I'm desiring it. Please. So he got on the phone, and he called the chancellery and, uh, to find the bishop's schedule as he was going around for the, the various youth and uh, come to find out that it wasn't that far off but a month and a half, and I could join um, the youth group that was being confirmed <laughs> as an adult in, in, in a month and a half. So I held off. It was a good, good, humbling experience, too. <laughs> brought in with the children. 
Yes, it was. You must be like a child, Jesus said. So that was very good. Yeah. My guess is a few in the audience may be wondering about you sitting here with the collar on. It might be good to finish your journey by talking about why are you sitting here with a white, with a clerical collar? What, what is the significance? Okay. And my Eastern spirituality, my Eastern readings, and we have a, a Byzantine, a Ruthenian Byzantine Catholic parish in San Diego, local for us, so we're, we were able to participate. And so we joined the church, we came back to the Catholic faith, and in the process went through the diaconate program, and I was ordained uh, to the diaconate, diaconate. Uh, February 16. Uh, 97. All right. So you're, you're serving as a deacon. Yes. All right. So that explains that. Uh, lots of questions, boy, that I'd like to bring up. Let's, let's begin uh, with dressing the theme for tonight, the sorrow of separation, not from a Catholic perspective. Talk about how as a Catholic we understand the unity of the church, what established the importance of the unity of the church. Well, the importance of, of the unity of the church is as important of, as the unity of, of uh, the Trinity, mm. and the unity for us, for a family. And if we if we bring it down to the level of a family, mm. a, a divine family, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or in our families, uh, mm. husband, wife, children, and you separate that, mm. you lose something. Mm. You lose the strength. You lose love. And in the in the same for the, the Catholic. Faith, it is so important to hold that unity because when we hold that unity, we hold on to the fullness of Christ. Mm -hmm. When we let go of that unity, we've lost. We've lost something. Especially if you, if you trace that unity, not by merely trying to, to look at where we now stand in history and understand unity, but go back to the beginning at, in Christ intending there to be unity amongst his followers. We see that as the most clear expression of the love that he said would be the sign and symbol of their faith in him. They will know you by your love. Yes. And so that is the unity. And when things get tough between differing personalities, it is the holding on of that unity that, where the love is expressed. The, 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 the love is the glue that, that, holds, that, that, that binds that union. And, and that's the union that we have in our church, that necessary union with Christ, but not just with Christ, but with one another. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where, in, in the Protestant mindset, that unity, that necessary unity of the faithful bound one to another in a common faith, in a common belief, that's what's missing. Yeah. In, in the it's there, you know, we'll affirm the reality that it is there at different levels. I know as a Presbyterian, you know, we saw a certain unity amongst us as Presbyterians, uh, but then when we looked at, well, what was our relationship as Presbyterians to the Methodists or to the Baptists or to the Lutherans mm -hmm. and on and on, or to the Catholics mm -hmm. or to others, there was different levels of breakdown, and so we ended up with this invisible unity. Mm -hmm. And as you were expressing, me and Jesus yeah. as the core. Well, going from there, maybe the obvious direction is, well, what about the separations that have existed throughout the history of the church? Well, there has from been, a perspective. from a Catholic perspective, there has been separations throughout the history of the church, past and present. Mm -hmm. And uh, from a, a Byzantine background, perhaps I can approach it in, in that respect, mm -hmm. though Jesus called to spread the message throughout the world that developed different Christian communities in the early church. Mm -hmm. And not different faiths, not different beliefs, but perhaps different traditions sure. and expressions of that one faith mm -hmm. broke open around different various regions around the world. And what we have in our one unified Catholic Church, we have 23 different rites or expressions mm -hmm. of the one full Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, a member of the Byzantine Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and that it, its roots came from um, the uh, Czechoslovakian, um, Hungarian region, the Carpathian mountain, uh, Mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a Christian community that developed um, throughout the centuries in that region. Mm -hmm. And their faith was brought to them from Constantinople mm -hmm. to, um, by St. Cyril and St. Methodius. They just had they, their feast day not long yes. ago. Yes, that's right. And uh, they <coughs> brought the liturgy. 
And interestingly, they brought the liturgy to uh, the Slavs in um, um, in the vernacular. <laughs> and in fact, the the, the Pope, Pope Adrian II, I think it was in uh, eight, in 860, something like that, had given approval for the use of the vernacular, or, well, or the use of Slovak, the, the Slovak the language, language yeah. in, in, at that time. But it, it's a whole different hmm. tradition, uh, but the same faith. And with a, within the, the Catholic faithful, we have, of course, the largest uh, expression of that faith that comes from the one of the Western rites, and that's the Latin Church, the Roman Church, the one that most of us in, in the West are most familiar with. Mm -hmm. But in San Diego itself, I know of um, approximately eight different churches, Catholic churches, represented by eight different bishops, just within San Diego itself. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about this unity, the 23 rites that you mm -hmm. mentioned, each on the one hand with, with many, many, many similarities that unite us, but there's also a diversity mm -hmm. on a variety of things. Talk about the place of the papacy in this unity. It's at the center. <laughs> All right. Let's talk a little bit more about that. If you're watching, that may not understand the place of that. Well, <laughs> well the the Pope is 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 three persons. He's the he's the patriarch of the West. He's uh, the Pope of Rome, and or he's the, the Pope of, the Bishop of Rome, right. and uh, he's the Vicar of Christ, unifying the whole Church. Mm -hmm is his center, the center of truth, mm -hmm. and the protector of truth. Okay. Each one of these different churches, the Latin Church, the Byzantine Church, the Maronite Church, the Melkite Catholic Church, all of these various Catholic churches are necessarily linked by Christ to this single head, mm -hmm. the head of the church that Christ in promised fact, us. In fact, was, was part of your journey uh, in moving towards the Byzantine rite Part of the emphasis behind your involvement in the writing of this book, Jesus, Peter, and the Keys. Uh, ask me that question again. Your movement to, towards the Byzantine, right, understanding its place in the unity. Was that part of your motive behind working on this book? No, okay. no, no. no the, the motive of the book uh, was brought about the three of us uh, got together on a regular basis and discussed the different aspects of our Catholic faith, whether that be uh, confession, the saints, purgatory, the different aspects of the papacy. Mm -hmm. And we looked at all the different issues from the scriptural perspective and traditional perspective, and we decided the first has to be authority. The authority of Christ on earth, present in the vicar of Christ, the Pope. And so that's what brought about that book. But Because all the other doctrines you were talking about all fall into place once you understand the pinnacle place exactly. of authority. Exactly behind discerning which of these other opinions is true on all these other issues. Get the authority, and they all fall into place, exactly. All right, all right. excellent. Um, talk a bit about, before we take a break here, as a lot of the questions that I, I considered asking, asking you, talk about the fact, you're also thinking of writing another book with Pat Madrid on the issue of separatist movements. We talk about separation and, and those groups from the Catholic Church. What about the, the, the problem of separation within? Within. And, and thanks for, for bringing that up. There is um, a movement with, or, or movements within our own Catholic faithful um, that look to find themselves holier than the Pope, <laughs> essentially. That is their own authority, an autocephalous and independent authority mm. apart from the Vicar of Christ. Mm. Now that doesn't exist. But that doesn't stop separations and groups, not unlike Protestantism, not unlike the Reformation, where through disagreement there was separation. So there are a number of different groups. Um, uh, the one that comes to mind first and foremost would be Archlip Archbishop Lefebvre's uh, group, uh, the SSPX, the Saint, the Papa Society of Saint Pius X, and this is a a traditionalist movement preying on non-suspecting Catholics. Mm -hmm. And the line is that the Pope is part of the new church. And they'll pay lip service to the authority of the Pope, but just lip service. Yeah. Underneath that is, is a desire to, to take away 
the Pope's authority and supplant it with their own authority. Mm -hmm. And they'll look for at different aspects of what they don't like within the Catholic Church, uh, misunderstandings that they've derived from the Second Vatican Councils. And um, some people are um, disappointed with the, uh, the Missae Cum Populo, or the, the, the New Mass, the mm -hmm. Novus Ordo. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's all fine and well. Not everyone can be satisfied with every aspect of every liturgy. And actually, the, you're... It's, I'm glad you're working on that because it's a, it's a need today because what these separatist groups, especially the enticing nature of those groups in pulling very faithful Catholics off, it's a, a, a good model of us even as we understand the groups that are separated from the Catholic Church, our Protestant brothers and sisters, or Orthodox, who in general the reasons they separated were very sincere people with very sincere goals, very sincere desires for renewal. But sometimes it was sincerely misled yes. too far uh, and putting themselves up above the authority of the church, breaking the love that, that bound them in union, uh, maybe misunderstanding the place of sin in the body of Christ. <laughs> in breaking that bond of love, and, and, and that's an important thing to keep an eye on with these separatist movements, and, and I just don't want to yeah. pick on the right. SSPX because I, I have empathy yeah. for many different things that they struggle with, right. but you will find a thread of anger mm. more prevalent than any thread yeah. of love yeah. within these organizations. All right, Deacon David, let's take a break now. It's time for us to take a break. Back just a moment with your questions for Deacon David Hess. Uh, anything we've talked about, but also maybe a little bit more about his uh, life of faith in the Byzantine Catholic Church. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is Deacon David Hess. You'll notice him sitting here looking like a priest. Well, those of you <laughs> don't realize it, that deacons are also expected to wear the clerical collar. In the as Byzantine. An, in the Byzantine rite, also in the Latin rite. Uh, different, different dioceses, I think, are a bit different. One of yeah. my best friends, Deacon, Deacon, Deacon Dominic Serrato of the Diocese of uh, Steubenville, Ohio, is a good friend of mine. He wears his collar whenever he teaches at Franciscan University. He's a good friend of mine. So I'm glad that you decided to wear it tonight. I think you have to wear it tonight, right? Well, if, if I'm dealing with anything of church nature, um, I'm required to, to wear it. That's yes. right. That's a wonderful expression of your faith. But when I go out on business or something like that, I don't. <laughs> All right. Um, or if you're going out for a morning jog or something. Yeah, like that, something right? like that. <laughs> All right. Let's take our first email. This comes from a faithful watcher, dear Marcus and Deacon Dave. You often mention the Byzantine faith, which is in communion with Rome, without mentioning the Orthodox faith, faith, which isn't. Can you please explain the similarities and differences expressed, especially in the liturgy? I'm glad we have the question, because there, it is confusing, not only to those mm -hmm. outside the Catholic faith, but even Catholics sometimes. Uh, I think Latin Rite Catholics don't always appreciate our Eastern Rite brothers yes. in the Church and make the distinctions. Talk about the similarities, differences. Well, the Divine Liturgy, as it's called in, in the Eastern Church, in the Eastern Catholic Church, Mass is called the Divine Liturgy. The liturgy that is celebrated most times of the year is called the, the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. And uh, in special occasions, the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil. And uh, some antiquity to those liturgies, yeah, I might right. add. But uh, the Eastern Church, w let me back up by saying that this is the, the second most widely used liturgy throughout Christendom today, mm -hmm. that second to, to the, the Roman Mass. Mm -hmm. and uh, But the similarities are striking because the Orthodox used to be Catholic. Yeah. 
And so they should be similar. In, the East, in, in Eastern Christendom, it was the one liturgy, the, Saint, the divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. And there, there are a couple of different other liturgies right. throughout different various rites. But that was the most predominant, or is the most predominant. So in that sense, the Eastern Catholic liturgy would be almost identical to it's Orthodox. almost identical except okay. for one aspect during uh, a couple of prayers and litanies and that is for prayers for the Pope obviously, okay, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right but w- wouldn't they though pray for him as the Bishop of Rome good question I, they should. They I mean they should they, they should you know, in their understanding of bishops and mm. their com- the communion of bishops I would think so but not as it's a good question I'm not sure yeah, but I'm not sure either. I'm not sure um, of course, one of the major differences, of course, is the union with Pope, yeah. with, with the Pope. That's probably the things yeah. that divide us the most. And, um, and sadly, another issue, not only in union with, with the Holy Father on the issue of unity, but union within themselves. Yeah. One Orthodox group to another Orthodox group without their connection with the hierarchy of, of the church, you have this division that prevents orthodoxy from having another ecumenical conference, council, which hasn't happened uh, in over a thousand years, um, or being able to speak with a unified voice on often difficult issues like abortion. The, the separation of orthodoxy and the separation and continued separation, it's essentially like Protestantism yeah. in the separations yeah. that take place. All right. Let's take our first caller. Uh, this is Naomi from Pennsylvania. Hello, Naomi. What's your question for? Hi. How are you? Just fine. Um, as a lifelong Catholic, I was taught that if you left the Catholic faith, it was a serious sin. And I was wondering if that you were catechized to that, and if that entered in, at all in your mind when you left the church or returned to the church. Thank, Thank you me. very much. That that is a good question, and it was first and foremost on my mind. And when I went back to my parish priest before confirmation was requested, I, I, I went to confession. Um, that was a serious sin for leaving the church and something that I needed to Now, correct. you saw that with hindsight in the sense that once your faith was reawakened later as an adult, mm-hmm. what about the time when you were a teenager uh, and, and leaving the church behind? Was it an issue to you then? Had it been no. A, okay, so it wasn't at that point. No, no, no. All right. And... Well, let's, let's talk about that. Was that a, I mean, we're not looking to, to, for heads to roll or anything, but was it as a result of bad catechesis or or as you look back on your early days? And I don't think I'm alone. In, oh, in, right, <laughs> right, right. And I could probably label myself a typical teenage kid that had other things that I found more important. Mm-hmm. And uh, essentially that's all it was, is I placed myself first, I found what I wanted, my desires to be of most importance, and that's how I led my life through the early years. Okay. Uh, let's take our next email. Thank you. This is from, uh, let's see, which one did we? They were doing a, a kind of a flip here on the emails. Uh, which one, where were we landed with? It was on, when I say okay. that, is the email that we get at this moment. This is from Jesse, with kindest regards, dear Davis, uh, Marcus and Dave. I, too, returned to the faith after a separation of 22 years. I read church, doc, church documents like the Quo Primum that made my return more fruitful. Did Dave read any church documents that helped him to re- decide his return as well? Thank you for the question. Yes, I did. I read uh, all of the documents of Vatican II. Hmm. The documents are put out by the church for the faithful. They're not put out to be put in a bookshelf someplace. <laughs> they're, they're published to be read. These are our guides for our faith. And let me go back to um, the separatist movement, for example, because it's so often that the v- Vatican II documents are ris- misrepresented by separatist movements to say what they would like you to think they say. But seldom have I found in my many discussions with uh, separatists, have they ever read the documents of Mm -hmm. Vatican II? Themselves. Themselves. It's so important. It's so necessary. It it makes our faith alive. And all of those documents, as well as uh, 
uh, fundamentals of Catholic dogma and Jurgens and, and mm -hmm. other things, but uh, the, the documents mm -hmm. are necessary. And the documents themselves helped me as I brought uh, on my journey back to the Catholic faith and in, in the, the Byzantine Church, it was the documents uh, a number of years back, um, Lumen Gentium, Ut Unum Sint, that uh, our Holy Father brought out, dealing with the Eastern Church yeah. and, and the greatness of, of, of the gift that we have of the East and his, his imploring us to, to breathe with both yeah. lungs, take advantage of that. You know, this, this flaw that is prevalent everywhere, and that is rather than to read it themselves, ourselves, depend on somebody else's expression of a document. It's sad because, first of all, it's true of those outside the Catholic Church that have not taken the time to truly read what the Catholic Church teaches. They depend on somebody else's summary of the Catholic Church without reading it for itself. So they get misinformation. And so my encouragement to those of you outside the Catholic Church that are watching the show, where did you get your information about the Catholic Church? Did you get it from actually reading faithful church documents? Or did you get it from some, not just a, a some something written by someone outside the Catholic Church, but maybe even a dissenting or a separatist Catholic who's angry at the church, giving a different view. Yeah. Then also within the, se the separatist movements, you have both the far-right separatist movements and the far left separatist movements within the church who themselves don't take the time to read the church documents themselves but are dependent on somebody else's interpretation yeah, yeah. misinterpretation so read, again read, read. <laughs> take the time read the church the documents that the church has given us as our expression of faith mm -hmm. the importance of that thank you very much let's take our next caller this is gregory from pennsylvania hello what's your question for us tonight hi um i want to Tell you, first of all, your program is very important to me as I just this past week have met with my priest in our local parish. I'm returning to the church. <laughs> and, Welcome uh, home, Gregory. Yes, I'm coming home, and it's very hard, so all please right. be praying for me uh, and my family. We'll encourage Absolutely. all the viewers to pray for Gregory. Um, uh, my wife and I, I've been Protestant for 13 years, uh, and as a sophomore in high school, I had this religious experience in which I accepted Christ as my Savior. Yeah. And uh, I wondered, uh, Deacon Hess, in your experiences in the Protestant Church, these, as Protestant, you know, I followed and I studied because of that religious experience, you know, mm -hmm. that, that conversion experience. And uh, now I kind of feel like, does that really have any value at this point? And how did you talk to fellow evangelicals at that time when you returned to the Church? And uh, they might have felt like, well, what are you trying to tell me about my, my experience with Christ coming into my heart? Great. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Very, very good question. And, and I know you want to tear into this one, too. <laughs> Go on. You take it first. Hold me back. Hold me back. But um, the church is the fullness, or uh, let me, Vatican II document would state that the, the fullness of truth subsists within the Catholic Church. That doesn't deny truths outside of the Catholic Church. Amen for the study. Amen for, for the, the scripture that you are, you are able to participate in and learn and that study because that has brought you to where you are today mm -hmm. on your journey. Right. Ready for me to jump in? Go ahead. Oh, oh man. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> because I'm just, Gregory, uh, I want to affirm you in your journey and your true experience of Christ. One thing that, that I have discovered in reading Catholic spirituality is that Catholic Spirituality talks about our need for multiple conversions and that we need in our journey of faith, just as, as human beings we go from infant to adolescent to adult, we do the same in our spiritual lives and they involve transitions that sometimes involve dark nights of the soul and then a transition or a conversion into these deeper relationships with Christ. Protestants, we call that being having a personal relationship with Christ. Catholics talk about it being in union with Christ or growing in fellowship with Christ. Now, the sad thing that I've encountered with so many converts is that there are Catholics brought up in the Catholic Church. They go through all the hoops, like you did, and like a conveyor belt of the Church, and they get all the information, but for some reason or another, they don't progress beyond the first conversion, which is baptism. Mm. That's the first conversion. And they stay there. And Gary Lagrange, a great Catholic writer, has said it's sad that most Christians fail to progress beyond the first conversion. 
But often, they experience that second conversion, not always in the Catholic Church. Sometimes, because of the environment or whatever, they have to be somewhere else to experience the reality of Christ. It is a true second conversion. But sadly, often with that powerful second conversion is the presumption on the side that the reason they hadn't had that earlier is because there was something wrong with the church, Mm -hmm. rather than recognizing that something that was wrong is in here. And so our desire in that second conversion is to come all the way to the fullness, which, Gregory, that's exactly what you're experiencing. Praise God for the completion of your second conversion, journey with Christ. Well, that's great. I'll keep Gregory in my prayers. We'll keep Gregory in our prayers. Wonderful. Oh, that we all would have that awakening aha experience with Christ that makes us hungry for righteousness, hungry for reading, hungry for growing in spirituality, which is what Christ wants of us. Let's take our next email. This is from Martin. Dear David, I know many deacons, and none of them wear a Roman collar. What diaconal ministry are you involved in? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the deacons that you're familiar with must be in the Roman diocese where they don't practice wearing the Roman collar. In the Byzantine church, in the, the 13, in the diocese, or eparchies we call them, in the 13 western United States, there are three deacons. I'm one of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So you won't see many of us. And we have uh, our normal duties. Uh, I have a lovely family and my three children. I also have a job during, during the week. My diaconal di- duties... Um, yeah, the difference between there is there's difference in the diaconal responsibilities in the Eastern Church, and that between the Eastern Church and that of the uh, the, the Latin Church. Mm-hmm. In the Latin Church, the diaconate is more of a social justice and and service. In the in the Eastern Church, the focus in the diaconate is more liturgical and catechetical. And in an, in the uh, Byzantine. Uh, liturgy, there is quite participation, there's a large participation of the deacon with interaction between the faithful, between uh, the priest, uh, the deacon is presenting the, the, the faithful before the heavenly realm. And there's a lot of liturgical move, move, movement. In fact, the, the St. John Chrysostom liturgy, the liturgies were developed with a deacon in mind. Whereas um, that the deacon with the priest, with the priest, with correct. The priest. Yes. In my words. Let's take our uh, next caller. It'll be our last caller for this evening, David from Texas. What's your question for us? Yes, thank you, Marcus uh-huh. and Deacon Hess. I'd like to first thank Deacon Hess for the book that he wrote. It it made a humongous difference in my life. That is my my conversion to Catholicism oh, great. from Eastern Orthodoxy. Oh wow! The question I have for Deacon Hess is. Does he honestly think that Eastern Orthodoxy will unite with Rome in our lifetime and explain a little bit of the jurisdictional problem in Eastern Orthodoxy, especially in America? Uh, that, that's a big question, but, but, but a short answer is God knows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we have a wonderful Holy Father that's calling us to be sensitive. And it, it, uh, please understand, when, when our Holy Father... And the church calls us to an ecumenical mindset. It's not calling for compromise mm. or watering down the faith. That is not the call. The call is in recognizing that which unites us and working for unity without compromise, but recognizing that we're called in Christ to love one another as Christ loved the church. I mean, that's our calling. Mm. We've got a couple minutes. How sure. about sharing with us how your journey back home and into your Byzantine right mm-hmm. uh, has drawn you closer? To your Lord Jesus. Oh, I, I would like to say that my life has made a miraculous change, and I became a millionaire because I <laughs> I came back to Christ, and I have no problems at home, and I have no worries. But you know that isn't true. <laughs> but what I do have is I have security. I have the grace of Jesus Christ. I have the hope that Christ protects me, the love that Christ gives me. And he's in my family. So that when things aren't perfect, I have Christ. Mm-hmm. It's inexpressible. And coming back home is the single most important step in my entire life. And now, 
I'm a father. I have uh, my daughter Charlena Dominic, my, my son, uh, our newest daughter, ten week, 11 weeks old now, uh, Christiana. But now I'm a father, and now my single most important responsibility in my entire life is to bring up my children in the Catholic faith. That's my only single most important responsibility, and that's what I get to do, and that's what I can do because I have Jesus Christ now. I have the fullness of Christ. I have his gifts. I have his grace. It's awesome. Deacon David, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for joining us on the journey. Thank you. I know that the audience appreciates your witness and also your faithful service in the church. Thank, thank you, you. Marcus. Uh, stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment with some final words for the journey home. Welcome back. As Deacon David and I were just reviewing a little bit of, of uh, the program, it always goes so fast, he reminded me of something he wanted to talk about that was an expression of his own journey, and it seems like a uh, wonderful way to, to bring this evening to a close. It was the image of the prodigal son in his own journey, and all the images that are there, of course it's there portrayed in the picture that's posted behind him on the set of Rembrandt's Return of the Sun. But this idea of the father in his great love for his son, letting the son go, trusting the son's journey, and yet never leaving, always waiting there for the son to come back. But there was one expression in the verse that David had said was important to him, and it's in verse 16 of Luke chapter 15. Let me read that. And this is about the son who's now gone and left everything and lost everything, is in the gutter essentially, and he says that he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he, he came to himself, and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, but I perish here with hunger. And then he talks about returning home. There's a sense in which, first of all, that coming to himself is like that second conversion. The awakening within to the reality of his own situation and what he had lost. But the images are wonderful. He'd have eaten the pods of the pigs if he could have anything. But then he realized that even the servants in his father's house had bread to eat. That wonderful image of the Eucharist, the bread that Christ has given us, his own body that feeds us as his family, that wonderful desire to come back into the family. That's part of, the, uh, of what Deacon David remembered that he missed from his childhood, that he then learned to appreciate because he had lost it. My guess is that there might be some of you lifelong Catholics that take for granted the wonderful gifts of bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ that we receive every week and every day in the Eucharist. Let's never take the church and our blessings for granted, for these are gifts from our loving Father. Thank you. Join you again next week.